Here's the greatest thing about Antoine Winfield Jr. signing his, or was about to sign his new contract. He was agreed to terms uh, with the Bucks, and it's a it's a whopping contract, folks. I mean, it's what you may have anticipated, but four years, eighty four point one million dollars. That makes him the highest paid defensive back in the NFL, much less the highest paid safety in the NFL. Of course, he was scheduled uh, to be their franchise. Uh, you know, player, and that would have been seventeen point one million on a one-year deal this year. Um, but they get it done, and the coolest thing to me about it was go back one year, last May, twenty twenty-three. Okay, on Instagram, he reposted this. Antoine Winfield Jr. is working out. He's shirtless. It's clear that he's at the end of a workout, um, and somebody, a female, is is uh, videotaping him. And he calls his shot, right? He says in this video, I want to be the highest paid, the highest paid this year. Mark my words. I'm going to come back and video this and say, I did it. I'll probably shed a tear. The power of the tongue. You've got to speak it into existence. All pro, highest paid. All pro, highest paid. All pro, highest paid. And eventually, it's going to become reality. So stay tuned. Woo. Hello. Now, that's greatness, right? And there might be a bunch of players out there that shot similar videos and they didn't make the Pro Bowl and they're not the highest paid player. But with Winfield, it's believable when you see him say it. And he's going to manifest it. And he did. He did. And now he is all that and and then some. Um, Listen, we all knew he was going to be just that when the Bucs decided to franchise tag him. And, um, and, you know, he did make, make all pro. And he is the best safety in football. Just look at his numbers. I mean, he did things last year that that safeties just don't do. Uh, in addition to the 122 tackles, he had 12 passes defense, eight quarterback hits, six sacks, six forced fumbles, four fumble recoveries, and three interceptions. All of those, by the way, are career highs. Uh, he shared the lead in forced fumbles and fumble recoveries. He's the only player since Hassan Reddick to do that. Um, and listen, the guy affects the game in so many ways. And we're not even having even talked about, you know, those hustle plays that he made against Atlanta, knocking the ball out of guy's hands and, and through the end zone for safety. Or how about sealing the game against Carolina with an interception? Or how about the sack fumble that results in a safety uh, recovered by the Bucks against it, uh, at Atlanta? Or how about Minnesota strip sack fumble recovery against the Vikings? Like from game one, up there in Minneapolis, he was making these plays. And they say he does it every day in practice, and it goes goes out on the field. He's also one of the smarter players on the team. He's just a great guy to deal with. I mean, the guy's a 10 as a human being. So this is the type of player that if you're going to make the highest paid at a position, you do it. And Jason Light did just that. And so I'm happy for him. But I I don't recall a guy that young. Now, he's only played three seasons, right, going into last year. And here he is predicting that he's going to be the highest paid player at his position. That's that's next level stuff, man. Well, you know, the great ones always have to either have a chip on their shoulder or, you know, that motivation that, that drives they want to them. be the best. Yeah. And, and, you know, to be the best, you have to love the mundane, love the mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. little things, you know. Yeah. How many times does is he working on the very basic stuff that most guys get bored with trying to do? Yeah. And yet he's going to do it every day, you know, or, mm-hmm. you know, how many times does, you know, Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant working on just the little tiny details that most people overlook and their Keep weaknesses. It. They'll take the, they'll take mm-hmm. the, not just what they do well, but they'll take the, the bad parts of their game. Remember Michael Jordan was not a great three point shooter. He became one, you know, mm-hmm. no question about it. Nikita Kucherov last off season. How many Same times thing. is he working on taking pucks off the wall? Yeah. And that he's done it for 15, 20 years, but he's still working on it every day for mm-hmm. an hour every day in, in Brandon all summer long. And that's how you become an MVP. That's how you become the scoring mm-hmm. leader. That's how you become the highest paid defensive back in football. That's, you know, right. It's, it's that hard work. And, and, but part of it is believing it and, and as he said, talking it into existence. And, yeah. you know, if you talk it enough and work it hard enough, it can get, it, get into existence and it did he just had i mean watching it 
as I did every game covering this guy, like I, I can't remember. I, I've not known many players that could fill up a stat sheet the way he does, much less a safety. You know, you're not looking for sacks really from safety. The only guy that could rush the quarterback like that was Ronnie Barber, and he has a gold jacket. And, you know, the year before, they thought it'd be a good idea to get Winfield closer to the line of scrimmage because, you know, generally speaking, the closer you are to the line of scrimmage, um, the more plays you can make on the ball, right? Um, and and you're more viable that way many times. But in Winfield's case, he almost was like – down in the box too much, okay? Mm-hmm. And because of that, he was taking on a lot of 300-pounders, and he got nicked up, you know? He's not the biggest guy. I mean, there, there's a lot of parallels between him and Barber, except that he plays safety, and Barber was a nickel corner. But they thought that he could play in the nickel because he's stout, and he's a good tackler. And he did his job, and he had a good year. But what they missed was, you know, sort of his ability to play center field as well. Um, but they still got him down there enough as a pass rusher. And his ability to rush passers is so unique because a little like Barber in that if he's one-on-one with a running back, he doesn't overpower the guy. He simply puts a move on him. (laughs) His feet are so good that it's like a running back trying to avoid a tackler. And he just like, you know, does a, you know, a little juke step here. And then the guy goes one way to lunges at him and he's gone, you know, um, and he just has a natural ability to sort of set up blockers like that when he's coming at him at 100 miles an hour. So it's really impressive just the skill set that this guy possesses. Not the biggest guy in the world. I mean, he's five foot nine, I think. Uh, and you know, he but 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 he's like I said, he's he's got some armor. He's he's rocked up pretty good, and he's got good speed, which a lot of guys that play safety don't. So he can cover. Uh, and he has good hands. He catches the ball when he gets to it. He's made some really great interceptions. I think he could make more. You know, every year um, they kind of challenge him to get 10. That's kind of like his goal. And he said that in the videotape. So he didn't get 10. He got three. But he did get, you know, six force fumble or fumble recoveries, six force fumble. Like, he makes plays all over the field. But not just – it's more about not just making plays, but like that Jordan-esque tight like – the clutch gene, right? Like – you need this putt. You need this 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 shot, or you need to set up John Paxton in the corner, you know, or Steve Kerr for the championship. Um, he makes the big play at the right time to help his team win games, and everybody kind of shakes their head. But it is it's all hard work. It's all preparation. And oh, by the way, I, the guy has an incredible IQ for football, mm-hmm. and and that goes back to his pedigree. His dad played twelve seasons, and Steve, there's something about as we all know, nature versus nurture, right? Mm-hmm. You got to have the physical components. It helps if you have, you know, uh, you know, a couple of professional athletes in your family or one that you're taking after. But more than that, it's about growing up in that environment, right? Understanding the game, having somebody that played 12 years at that position in the NFL who's built very similar like you, teach you how to play. And then for you to then have that same fire to want to go out there and even be better than your than your dad was, who was a really really good player that you saw in Minnesota a whole a whole lot. So, you I, know, I loved watching his dad play for the Vikings when mm-hmm. I lived up there for three years. Yeah, he controlled the game from the back, which is like, so hard to do. There's right? not many I mean, players. I mean, you think of the Ronnie Lots and yeah, the Troy yeah. Palomalos, and there's not many that can control it from the back like like Ant- his dad could. Yeah, and, and you could just see, and he would fill up the stat sheet too: fumble recoveries or a pick here and returns, oh, yeah. and you know. But it, you could just when you watch the game, particularly in person, because you can see that a lot better. They don't always show the DBs the whole time. Right. But when you're there in person, you see how a- 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 Antoine just could control. He could see the game. You could tell he knew what was coming most of the time. Yeah. By yeah. the way, he would move play or move other players around, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was just so impressive. And you see that in Junior. You see it, or it, and you know you always say greatness shows up early. It does. It really does. And, and you see it, but a lot of it is the mental part of it too, that he's always in the right spot. He's, and that's how you make those plays. Like, oh, yeah. make them, those plays aren't luck. No, that's preparation. No. That's knowing, hey, this is where this play is going to be. Or film this is, study this is and enjoying Absolutely. like the diag, you know, the, the extra work, um, mm-hmm. not just physical, but but in the film room and 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 like you said, understanding what teams are trying to do to, to, to account for you, 
and, and how you can, you know, counter it. And it's just, it's such a, a chess game. And usually guys that play that far off the ball, you know, there's, I mean, the Ed Reeds and people like that were ball mm-hmm. hawks, right? So yes. they had their, their own set of skills. But to see a safety affected at all three levels, like a Ronnie Lott did, and again, this is not a big man. I mean, you stand next to him, and he, like I said, he spends some time in the weight room, don't get me wrong. Um, but he, you know, in a game where you have guys that are six foot six, 330 pounds running at you, you know, you better have a, a plan for survival out there. You know, Rodney Barber always sort of ducked under those guys and around those guys and, and had a plan on how to tackle certain people so that he wouldn't get flattened, you know? And, and, and so, you know, he sort of went into it that way and, and was able to react on the fly and managed to not what miss a game, I think in his entire career, really. Um, and, and Winfield's kind of the same way, although he has missed some games, but I think they've found the perfect spot for him. And I would say this, if you think Antoine Winfield was good last year, wait till you see him with Jordan Whitehead. Those two, you know, were young players that came in here together. And by the time that Jordan left, they won a Super Bowl, and they were driving this defense from the back end many times. Now it helped, you know, that those guys up front, especially in the Super Bowl and the playoffs got after the quarterback but you know why they could do that they could do that because they didn't have to bring blitzes you know and they could play coverage and 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 the combination of the coverage and the pass rush work together and that's how you get to the quarterback you lock those receivers down you have people in position that make plays on the ball and those quarterbacks just aren't quite sure right where where to where to let the ball go how to let it go when to let it go I mean we watched you know no less than Patrick Mahomes get chased 500 yards around the field in a Super Bowl and could not score a touchdown. And, you know, a lot of that in Winfield had an interception in that game. A lot of that is because of the coverage on the back end was so tight. And so, you know, he's he has been everything and then some that they could have ever hoped hoped he could be. Now, now here's the situation, okay, about all of this. Winfield was down to make 17.1 point uh, 17.123 million dollars this year as a franchise player which is you know a full one year contract you take all 17 million on the salary cap in 2024 now that he has a four year deal and there's a signing bonus and is amortized over the four years etc they've lowered that that uh, salary for 2024 to 7 million so they actually saved 10 million dollars on this year's salary cap now future years this is going to catch up to you right i mean there's only so many great players you can give all time money to, right? You great, you're the highest paid, you're the highest paid, you're the highest paid. You can only do that so many times, and then you don't have a football team, right? You have to start making tough decisions, and those decisions will come down the road. Um, and but for now, he's actually improved their cap so they can sign their draft picks, they can have some money to operate the club, maybe even sign another free agent if they needed one late uh, before training camp or something like that. And then there's, I, they're not done. I mean, think about the year that Jason Light has had this offseason, right? And all the question marks about how can they get these guys back and who's going to come back. And, and, and you know, you start with um, a guy like, you know, Mike Evans and a legacy player that for all the world looked like he could have tested the market and made more money, maybe gone to Houston, maybe gone to Dallas, a lot of different places. So he stays. And then you get Baker Mayfield back. And then you get Levante David back. Um, and you go, you start checking these boxes and going right down the line. And now it's Winfield. Well, the next guy is going to be Tristan Wirfs. And for as much as Winfield's contract is enormous and and it is, and we can break it down further, but it's not going to be even necessarily close to what Tristan is going to sign for. Tristan Wirfs will also be just right in the highest paid tackle in football. I think Panay Sewell recently got a deal done. Um, you know, Tristan's going to average like $25 million a year. That's, that's probably what his, what his takeaway is going to be. And so he's the next guy I think that will sign before, maybe before the season anyway. Speaking of the NFL, of course, their schedule is set to be released on Wednesday night and, uh, that'll be on their, uh, their show as well as online everywhere. And already, um, there are some announcements that have begun to come from, New York, uh, one of those being the first game of the regular season, and that's going to be your world champion Kansas City Chiefs. Not a surprise. They're hosting a, a game on Thursday night of week one. And, you know, the Bucks are one of those teams that go to Kansas City. So there was a 
one in, I don't know, seven or eight chance uh, that they, they could be that team. Well, they're not. It's going to be a rematch of the AFC Championship game. Not a surprise, but the Baltimore Ravens will be headed to Arrowhead to play the Kansas City Chiefs on opening night in the NFL, that Thursday night game that's become very popular and uh, certainly well-rated. Um, so that's one that uh, the league was was willing to announce. There's been some other leaks here and there. The one that uh, caught my eye, Steve, is that the debut of Tom Brady as a commentator, which this is shocking news to me to begin with, He's actually going to go through with it. He's going to do color commentary with Fox's number one team. His first game for Fox is, yeah, at Cleveland. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's Dallas at Cleveland. Wait, wait, wait. I was wait, like. Wait, wait, I retired. I'm not playing. <laughs> I'm going to be your number one. You're sending me to. Cle- I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'll put I'm, Greg Olson back in. This, right. I'm done. Hey, Hey, Greg, how about you take the Cleveland game? Where are they sending you? <laughs> this is how this is going to go, right? Like, are you kidding me? Dallas at Cleveland? That's the number one game for Fox that really week? I believe that Tom's going to do a great job. Oh, broadcast my God. Week. Don't you know Jerry's? I mean, you know, it's a good game, I suppose. I mean, Dallas is a playoff team. Cleveland you know, was one, too. Um you know, the best news of this, though, is that we don't have to watch the Cowboys in primetime in week one. Boy, that's true. There you go. But um bump Yeah, by the time we get to Sunday, we won't have to hear anything about the Cowboys unless they win, and then they'll still be talking about them on, on uh, every TV show there is. But, um, yeah, so Tom Brady. So he gets to pick apart Dak Prescott and, uh, and, Wa- and uh, Deshaun Watson in week one. So – have fun, <laughs> have fun, Tom. <laughs> Tom Tom won't give, out, he won't care at all about. I'm convinced that Brady's going to let it rip on any quarterback anywhere, anytime. Right? You think they roasted him? Wait till he gets in the booth and starts tearing apart these quarterbacks on Sunday. I'm telling you, man. Ooh. Oh, they hey, they won't have to have an official roast for these guys because I think Tom's going to take them all apart. Because he, here's the thing, they're not his colleagues. I mean, most of these guys were, you know, don't remember him playing at Michigan or, you know, being drafted in the seventh round, their careers aren't even 20 years old, right? Some of them are in their 20s. So, you know, Tom, Tom, Tom's contemporaries are all retired. You know, they were the ones that were roasting him in in, uh, in Los Angeles uh, a, a week ago. But, um, yeah, that's this is, uh, is going to be fun. And so, yeah, his first – as if Dak Prescott doesn't go through enough scrutiny. Oh. <laughs> I mean – I really believe what Brady said was spot on. Dak's got to play better. He knows it. Um, it's going to be fun. But, uh, yeah, well, enjoy Cleveland, Tom. Nothing against Cleveland. I know that a lot of people probably listen to this podcast are from Cleveland. I've had nothing but great times there, to be honest with you. It's a little cold, but not in September. I mean, hey, if there's one good thing, if, he's gonna, if somebody was going to insist on Brady doing a game in Cleveland, they did him a favor in sending him there this time of year. But well, There's a reason it's called the mistake on the lake. Ooh, really? <laughs> Said the guy from Cincinnati? Yeah, well, they put the lake on fire at one point. You know, I know, you... but that was like way back in, what, the <laughs> 70s or something? I don't know. Um, you're the Sam White's guy. Hey, you're not from Cleveland. Where you we live grab in the Cincinnati. Microphone? You don't live in Cleveland. Yeah. You don't live in Cleveland. Oh, yeah, Sam. I could do a show on Sam. Sam I am. Good neighbor, Sam. God love him. May he rest in peace. He was uh, He was a character in the years he had in Tampa. Was not without uh, was not without its um, its moments. So, so if Brady's going to Cleveland, how many people in the Bra- the uh, Browns organization, yep. from the time he gets to town, whether it's Friday or Saturday, whenever he gets to, are going to be begging him to come back and play for them? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that long that you, we've all seen those jerseys with the list of all the quarterbacks' names that they've had since like nineteen ninety nine or might whatever. Well add Brady to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I you know what I. Here's what here's kind of interesting. Well, I mean they'll they'll welcome Belichick as as well. I'm sure. Oh, I Cleveland. don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> in Cleveland, um, here's what's interesting is that uh, you know Brady beat all these teams right in the AFC. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think there's many fan bases that are fond of Tom Brady because he kicked their butts. Now maybe it'll be different because I mean Troy Aikman beat a lot of people too, um, but. I'm interested to see just what the reaction is at times when he, you know, and 
not for nothing, but like, are you really sure the guys were tired? So when you have them into the production meeting rooms, are you really going to break down your defense for them? Nope. Tell them how, how it operates, what they look for. I don't know. Like what well, are those? Maybe he's filming their sidelines already. And, you know, <laughs> That's got true. He already in. knows. He already knows. <laughs> he's got the tapes. I'm what watching the dynasty uh, on Apple TV. So. Oh, it's so good. By it the way, is. it is. I'm four or five episodes in right now, but yeah. 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 But here's What'd one other think? thing. I mean, you know, Tom Brady gets to call the, the Cowboys first game of the season. Of course, Tom Brady's been to as many NFC championship games as the Cowboys since 1995. Oof. He was only in the league three years. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's the conference. True. That's true. Yeah, Jerry's still trying to go back since the 90s, but uh, Tom's already been there and, and won a Super Bowl in the NFC. <laughs> He's won as many Super Bowls. In, yeah, I, that's really – that's something. But um, it's I, I still can't believe he's not going to play football. Like, there's still a part of me that says, just wait. You, yeah, you people are all fooled. Yeah, he may go in the booth. And, yeah, he may – of course, there's a whole thing about the ownership thing in Oakland – or not Oakland, the Raiders, Las Vegas – um, whether or not you know he's he's able to play someplace else, they still haven't approved that deal, as far as I know. So maybe he's a free agent, but um, yeah, he's actually gonna he's actually gonna do it, and um, hopefully, hopefully this will sort of you know quench his thirst for relevance and and uh, appearing on TV. Because the further I get away from that roast, Steve, the more I wonder why he did it. Uh, seriously, I I. I've seen the comedians go on and talk about the roast and I saw the roast and there were parts of it that were amusing and some were just damn funny, but on the whole, like there had to be a financial, a huge financial windfall. And Oh, by the way, the league hasn't announced it yet, but the, the rumors are, uh, by Boomer Esiason and others in, in, uh, in the media is that those two Christmas day games are going to be streamed on, uh, Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. And so if Netflix is getting in, you know, crawling into bed with the NFL, maybe, you know, doing a live roast with a bunch of NFL stars might have been that entry into it kind of as a test case. Like, can you guys handle a live broadcast and this kind of stuff? I don't know. Well, perhaps um, Brady's on, you know, could also do maybe he moonlights the games on Netflix on Christmas yes, Day as well as Fox and gets paid because for that. he needs the checks. Yes. Well, yeah, he needs the checks. Obviously, he's chasing. Uh, he did go through a divorce. I mean, you know, well, yeah. And then he what actually about crypto? gained stuff because she was worth more than him. But, you know, sure. Well, maybe. What What about what about the crypto, though? He lost lost uh, a lot yeah. in crypto. Yes, perhaps. And so who knows? Uh, poor guy. I don't know if, if he's going to make ends meet, but. Yeah, there might be there might be like a dual role. Maybe he does a little, you know, little Netflix here. Maybe a series down the road. I mean, I don't know, but um, but it's interesting that that he that he subjected himself. And I've heard this. I haven't seen if it's official. I have to probably check the wire, as the kids say. Um, but is it? Did I? Am I right that somebody said Tiger Woods might be the next uh, person to? to be roasted by that group that I think that would be an even more egregious mistake that to be was, honest. That with one you. would be Ooh. very uncomfortable. Or oh, quick. just, <laughs> I mean, where do you begin? Right? Like, um, yeah. I mean, and there's, Tom's teammates loved him, loved him. And, and for the most part, um, relationships aside, yeah. right. For the most part and his looks and the obvious, you know, mm -hmm. uh, comments about that. But, he was squeaky clean, right? Like he, you know, never had, again, relationship problems, sure, but never really had incidents. Like Tiger Woods, man, <laughs> there's a lot his, of incidents. His competitors did not like him. No. They, some of them may now, and it's it's a different dynamic Yeah, you know, 20 years later, but when He's he was in his more prime, human now, yeah. he was not liked by his fellow golfers. No. Uh-uh. Like it could get really uncomfortable. And then the personal stuff is is out there, right? I mean, there's just so much of it, like with Tiger Woods, that I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I mean, how much would they put off limits? Apparently, you know, there's Tom, nothing. Tom's this kids, is... Tom's kids were off limits, which most people wouldn't go there anyway. And Tom didn't like the Bob Kraft joke. He didn't like the Kraft joke. He shut that down. But I'll tell you yeah. something. About... But they, they, some of the comedians and people that were roasting said those were the two things that were off limits: was Bob Kraft. Yeah. And his kid, and the kids part, I completely get should be absolutely. Well, they didn't get they didn't go after the children, but let me let me ask they you this question. <laughs> well, and and Bridget Moynihan was mm -hmm. there was jokes about her. Um, I had somebody tell me 
that knows Tom Brady pretty well, that they were embarrassed for him and that if, if they were his children, they may never speak to him again because of what was said about their mothers. Now, I don't think that's going to be the case, obviously, but that's how that was received by some people, right? Like, this is beyond the pale sort of stuff, you know? Like, those are the mother of your children, after all, and she has them, <laughs> probably in the living room, right? If she's watching, God forbid. But, yeah, it was just there was just some things that I just didn't think was necessary. But, hey, you know, Tom's done fine without advice from me, that's for sure, uh, and he will continue to do so. But, uh, yeah, so interesting. So he starts in Cleveland. Um, I think that, you know, somebody asked me, like, what's so, you know, this schedule reveal has become a big thing, like everything in the NFL, right? They they save a day for it. They sell advertising for it. And there's some drama leading up to it. We thought it was going to be last Thursday. Now it's going to be um, t- uh, tonight, actually. No, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Yeah, Wednesday night. Wednesday night, usually around 8 o'clock or so. Of course, I like to see it because I want to know what my where I'm going to be in the fall, you know, including the holidays. But well, but fans too, your season ticket fan, members want to know. Hey, absolutely. what weekend, what weekends are do we have? Plan your games? trips. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when are we trips? on a Monday night? When are we on Thursday night? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You National know. team. That's what you look for. I look for week one. Okay, because that's the only game that 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 you can really look up to. Uh, are they on the road? Are they home? Where are they at? Then I look at national TV games next. Because I want to see personally how many eight o'clock deadlines, you know, <laughs> or midnight deadlines I'm going to get when the game. Three a.m. podcast. Yeah, three a.m. podcast and six a.m. flights. That's what I'm all about on those national TV games. I fear that because the Bucks were a playoff team and actually won a playoff game, they might have three or four. I fear that. I could see that occurring. Right. I don't. Um, I don't think so. Not now don't? that Atlanta is considered the favorite in the division. Eh, yeah, maybe. But you did make but, but, it to the postseason, they, they are and playing, you did win a game, and you're playing Detroit again. No, I realize that, but they, the the TV networks look at ratings. Like, are the Bucks a sexy sexy pick? No. Now they are playing a first place schedule, which means they're playing a lot of teams. That they're playing, yeah, the San Francisco at home, the yeah. Ravens at home. You're playing uh, the Chiefs. You're playing at, at the Chiefs at Detroit. Yeah, you're playing a lot of first teams. place teams. Yeah, you're playing the, the Cowboys. Division. You're playing. Green you're Bay. playing the teams that they love to put on national Green TV. Bay, so maybe maybe you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah it's that and there's a New York game in there, you know. Um, so there might there might be some national TV because not every national TV game is a you know is a slam dunk. I think the Sunday night has a better deal than Monday night. Well, there are sure. limits to how many primetime games each team can get. So yeah, you know. no, they wouldn't get more than three. I think maybe. No, maybe but what I'm saying is like you can't put the Cowboys on every. Prime no. time game. You can't no, put no, no, no. No, the I think Chiefs it's five. on every prime time. Yes. Yeah, I think yeah. it's five. But um, but they, they certainly could have their share. And, of course, last year, um, other than, I think, the Thursday night game and one Monday night game, I recall, uh, their yeah. games were all at, like, 1 o'clock, unless they were on the West Coast, which is awesome. Yeah, it was no Brady. You're at 1 o'clock yeah. now on Sunday. Yeah, you're, you're straight up 1 o'clock. And people thought, you know, in the media that they were going to win two, three games, that sort of thing. Well, now we know they didn't. And, and I think... Actually, I, I actually think Mayfield is a good story now, and there's some stability with him. And the team, you know, they re-signed their players. They've added – they had a good draft. Um, you know, so there's a there's a reasonable chance that they might be sexy enough to be paired with another team and maybe a rivalry, maybe a, maybe a Detroit or, you know, that was a good playoff game. Mm-hmm. Like maybe they'll be nostalgic for that. We'll see. But um, but I, I, like, I like the uh, – I like the schedule reveal. That's that's a big day. That's a big day uh, in the Stroud house. Well, what's industry. great about it, like in football, compared to even really the other sports, but for football is is not only do you know the schedule now, but you actually know the primetime games. And now they can flex some as we get later in the season. But yeah, you know, like college football, it's always hard because you don't know the game time till ten days or twelve days beforehand. That's true. Like they're starting to reveal a couple of the early season games now, and and usually the first three or four weeks you'll know, but then mm-hmm. after that it's a twelve day notice to release game times, and sometimes they they can push it all the way back to six days prior, so you don't know if you got a new how, game or a seven o'clock game. If you're a fan of those teams, how do you begin to plan anything really? Well, I mean, you basically have to say, hey, it's it's college football. We're going to plan all day Saturday. 
plan on being there for noon kickoff and then yeah, see it what could happens. be noon, could be seven, could be you know you're planning for whatever. Now, granted, it's a Saturday, so you know if you're working a Monday through Friday job, you've got the yeah. next day off, so it's not like the NFL where That's all true. of a sudden they could kick it to Sunday night and you got to work Monday morning. That's true. So you do know that part, but just make sure there's gas in the RV or the Winnebago or whatever the hell you're driving up to yeah. uh, Knoxville and park outside in the parking lot, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Get the polyester pants going, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, those boosters follow those those kids around wherever they go. And you're right, Sunday Sunday's not typically a uh, Monday through Friday work day, so you got time to get back home and and uh, rest up and and uh, go to work on Monday. So that that's not as as I guess urgent, but yeah, there's there's always some there's always and there's always you know look scheduling for as much as it's got to be a nightmare to try to put these together because a lot of teams share arenas with other events or maybe teams and that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of variables involved, but don't think the NFL doesn't you know they talk about balance right? They talk about competitive balance. The NFL chooses winners. They do. They reward the winners. To the victors go the spoils. Unabashedly, they do it every single year. And how they do it? Well, one way they do it is where's the bye week? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing you look at the schedule release. Absolutely. Because here's the thing. You want to know who they don't think can play very well? Look at the teams that get the first bye week. Those are the losers that the NFL has picked. And last year, that was your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. By week, earliest one of the season, after four games, week four, by week and week five. Now, that's that's the reason why that's important is they're telling you they don't think you're very good. Why are they telling you that? Because they're willing to take your team off the field after you've just kind of got going for the first month. Remember, the Bucks were three and one at that point. And they're willing to say to you, hey, we know you're not really tired or probably even hurt. But we want you to take this week off because we want to save the bye weeks for sort of closer to the middle of the season when teams are sort of beat up and need could need a break. We're, yeah, we're saving those for the teams that are in the playoffs. We're saving those for the teams that might make it to the Super Bowl, right? And that's the way it was with Brady every year. I think the three years he was here, I don't think we had a bye week before week eight ever, you know, and we didn't have one past week 10. Yeah, the first year, remember, it was late because that was when they turned the season around. Was after that's the right. Yeah, they were seven and what seven and five, I think. It was like week twelve or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so they turned it around, and and so that's how you find out who does the NFL really think is going to be in contention, and more to the point, who are they trying to help? Like it's helpful to your football team to not have to go right from week five all the way to week, you know know what 19 or 18 you know um because you play that many games in a row and you start getting guys hurt it's going to be a big big problem and and you just don't have the extra time the bye week to get some people back so the the league does pick winners and losers for as much as they talk about competitive balance and salary cap and the draft system and all those things are supposed to make them all eight and eight um they put their hand on the scale and they're going to do that again wednesday you're going to see based on you know when those bye weeks fall and, and other things who the NFL really really believes or prefers uh make it you know all the way to the playoffs okay finally uh the Tampa Bay Rays off to a good start on this road trip already they go up to Boston and they uh take down the Red Sox 5 to 3 this is a weird game Steve so they come out and the Rays jump to a quick three to nothing lead, mm -hmm. right? And and Cutter Crawford, who's been lights out for the Red Sox. Red Sox, by the way, have the best pitching not just in the American League, in all of baseball. Mm -hmm. Like their starters' ERA is is minuscule, and Cutter Crawford has been really really good on this staff. And they jump him uh, for three runs, and then they give up three themselves. <laughs> Zach Eflin. Uh, got roughed up a little bit early, uh, kind of a two-out double, and, and and one thing led to another. And all of a sudden, it's 3-3, three, three, right? But, I mean, look, I, I credit the Rays who 
like did a really good job and had some really good at bats against Cutter. Uh, and you had some hustle by Jose Caballero. Um, you know, he, he kind of turned a, you know, some of a, a ball that kind of fell in over first into a double. He stole third, uh, and then he tags up and scores, you know, on Jose Siri lines one to left. Um, that gave him the lead, and then they expanded that to five to three in the eighth. But but they, they did just enough offensively, and then the bullpen took over. And Kevin Kelly pitched the sixth and seventh. Garrett Clevenger had the eighth, and Jason Adam closed it out in the ninth. Let me say this, though, and I, I tweeted something about this. So the Rays, Steve, are famous for this, right? They're famous for finding these fringe pitchers that have fallen – you know, asunder or whatever with some organization and they pick them up and then they work with them and Kyle Snyder works with them and they throw the analytics at them. They say, see, when you throw this pitch, you get this and that and the other. And the next thing you know, these guys are bona fide starters many times, converted as they may be, Drew Rasmussen, um, Jeffrey Springs, et cetera. The list is long. You know who they need to do this with next? Garrett Clevenger. So you're saying he's the next Zach Littell. I'm saying he is the next Zach Littell. Yes, the left-handed version of Zach Littell. His stuff is insanely good. Now, I don't know if he can do it. You know, you know, another part of this is they ask a guy to go out there, throw as hard and as long as you can, you know, and do it for an inning. But he's got – he his stuff, just the stuff is is ridiculous. It's so good. Um, against lefties or righties. I mean, he's overpowering with the fastball. He's got good control. He doesn't walk a lot of a lot of hitters. Um, certainly has an array of breaking balls and things, but just keeps guys off balance and can throw heat. I mean, he gets it up there sometimes well above 95. And I don't know. I can see him becoming down the road if they needed him to be, or maybe he just becomes their one of their top closers, but you know, certainly has a good role on the team now. Doesn't he seem to be that kind of guy that they would take and turn him into like a, you know, top of the rotation starter? Yeah, I could, you know, if they can lengthen him out. I don't know if he's been a starter previously. I don't either. I know, you know nothing about. I'll like be honest. I know nothing about him. Yeah, I don't know. Perhaps you know, not. I guess the question would be: Do they think you know they can stretch him out, not just this year, but you know, future years, long yeah. term? That they think that he can hold up as a, as a starter. I mean. You know, they kind of did it with Zach Littell last year. Right, in right. Emergence, they were running out of pitchers, basically, and needed someone. And Yeah, it might be one of those fantastic. deals where you, you just, like, you get some guy in the IL and you need a you need somebody to start a game for you. Um, that might be what it's born out of necessity. But just stuff-wise, oof. And there's nothing wrong with having a guy like that in the bullpen, especially a left-handed, right? Because mm -hmm. if you get a part of the order like they did in the eighth and you might have a left-handed bat coming up here or there, He's just he's filthy against those guys, but he's good against both, really both sides of the plate. And I was just so so impressed with him the last few times he's been out there, um, just watching his stuff, you know. And and he throws strikes, but he throws not just getting it over strikes. Like he he you know he hits corners and moves the ball around and keeps him off balance and just just kind of looks like he knows how to pitch, you know. So he did a nice job. Their bullpen did a nice job. So now they're back to five hundred, right? Mm -hmm. Now they've won uh, what seven out of their last ten. Yep, and I they're believe. two and two in this thirteen game stretch against the AL East. Yeah, so nice start for them. Yep. Now they got to keep it going. Yep, and then Brendan Lau now seeing a specialist. Oh God! He hit a home run what Sunday? <sighs> Durham Must have swung too hard. Said he still his oblique didn't feel right. So yeah, gonna go see a specialist. I don't even know exactly where the oblique is. It sounds painful. I'm sure it is. But, like, how do you hurt it? I mean, too much torque, too much core movement. Like, what do you do? Swung too hard, perhaps. I don't I don't make that much movement to know where it is or how <laughs> exactly. you hurt it. Exactly. Like, I played a long time. I never swung hard enough to hurt anything. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> including the ball. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something that just keeps reoccurring with him. However, I guess uh, what Aranda's getting ready to come off the IL, right? I believe Soon? so. Yeah, he's been rehabbing in that. So, yeah, um, the That's more bats bat. they can get up here, the better. And the other thing is, Steve, he, is he? He's a left-handed bat, right? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Throws with the right, but he does bat left-handed. So it'd be another left-handed bat. Which is look, that's what they've been missing 
for most of the first part, you didn't have Josh Lowe. You didn't have sure. Brandon Lau. You sure. didn't have Jonathan Aranda. Like all these left handed bats. Right. Right. You know, you could put together an all right handed lineup, and they did many times anytime they faced a left handed pitcher. Yeah. But they were lacking left handed bats, and you're starting to get those guys back now, or at least some mm-hmm. of them. And it's and it, it's allowing them to play guys more in those advantageous positions that we always talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, not playing against the pitchers that are bad matchups for you. And it's not exactly. always just lefty, righty, righty, lefty, but just this pitcher stuff is a bad matchup for this hitter. We don't play them against that type of pitcher. Mm-hmm. And, and they, you know, they know the book on all their players. So that's one of the things the Rays do very well is, okay, Brendan Lau doesn't hit lefties very well, but there are certain types of lefties he does okay against, and they'll play him against those. Sure. Just don't play him against the ones that he doesn't hit well. And Smart. that's how you help players one, improve their stats in that, but their confidence and everything else and, and put your team in a position to win. In the best position, yeah. Yeah, and I think Aranda can play both infield and outfield, but he's played second base, and, mm-hmm. you know, they, they've they moved. Ahmad Rosario has played everywhere, you know, yep. and he's he kind of has done a nice job everywhere. But yes, Palacios has played a lot of places. Palacios, I think, played second the other night. So they're kind of using guys, you know, outfield, infield, outfield, infield, but I think Aranda does a nice job. Uh, when they put him at second as well. So just more flexibility and, like you said, another left-handed bat. So that's going to help them. But a good start to the road trip. Uh, like I said, the Red Sox are a very good team. They're off to a terrific start. Their pitching has been really good, and um, they've been getting some key hits. They, they they remind you of the Rays, what the Rays try to become or have been in the past, which is really good pitching and good defense and just enough offense. You know, If they were scoring a lot more runs, I mean, with that ERA – they should probably be more than what are they like three games over five hundred or somewhere in there. Um, they should probably have a little better record than they do if it was just the pitching, but they haven't scored an abundance of runs either. And if you look at the lineup, you kind of go, eh, "Who are these guys?" So they're sort of in that that raise mode um, that we've seen here in the past. But off to a good start, and so it was a good win at uh, Fenway Park where they hit it wicked far, uh, and so you know, got four games with them, and then it's on to. Uh, Toronto. To play Toronto. Yeah, the play of Blue Jays. So big AL East sort of road trip going on. Anyway, um, let's see. So, yeah, we got the Bucks, uh, their schedule, the NFL schedule coming out Wednesday. I'll have more stories, uh, some, you know, some leftover stuff from the Bucks rookie mini camp. They got OTAs coming up. We're going to be at those uh, three times, I think, out of about nine OTAs. June 13th will be the last mandatory mini camp and then uh i don't know maybe i'll take out get out of here for a little while and take some vacation you probably should too what but, what, uh, what what's, what's that what's that i know it's it's a nasty word but it's got, something that we need and that we got to figure out you got any comp time coming uh I don't, no that i don't know what that is i haven't had that since probably about 1996 but um that would be nice too but no the nfl as you know 50 a week a year business i will and uh, i will not be here for 50 weeks but um, but yeah, the last, the last, uh, sort of gathering between players until they come back for training camp will be, uh, the final day is June 13th and, uh, don't call me after that. Okay. Just, I mean, you can, but like, I don't, nobody else can bother me after that. I'm really <laughs> going to check out. I don't even know where I'm going, but I'm going to check out for sure. So anyway, thanks for listening. Um, hey, if you want to get mailbag questions in this week, I'm sure we'll do one. You can do that on Twitter at SportsDayTB. You can reach me on Twitter at NFL Stroud. My email address is rstroud at tampabay.com. I'm getting some uh, some good emails and, uh, and questions already on that. So uh, I'm sure we'll put one together and do it later this week. And we'll see if the Rays can continue their uh, success in Boston and um, see if they can take game two up there against the Red Sox in a four-game set. So should be fun. Thanks for listening. For Steve Burstick, I'm Rick Stroud of the Tampa Bay Times. Have a great day, everybody.